Thanks, you guys, for coming back. And i um, really excited to share this information with you because it's something that, you know, you can bang on and on and on and on about all the terrible things that could happen to honeybees, you know? And it's just like, shoot, if you sat down and had a lecture about all the terrible things that could happen to humans, you would just like, oh my God, I couldn't even be a human, you know? There's just so much stuff out there. And comparatively, like, there's not a whole lot of things that can go wrong with honeybees, and you just have to be aware of the handful of problems, primarily American fowl brood, what to do with it, and then everything else can pretty much be solved through really good management, which focuses on nutrition, and then keeping really good stock in your colonies. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, I just want to give, bring awareness to, I have, if anybody has emailed me in the past, I have this new email address, um, and it reflects my newfound, newly launching company name, business, business name. Uh, called Bee Scientifics. So you can come visit my website, bscientifics.com. If you go to bscientifics.com.au, you'll get there as well. Um, and then email addresses at bscientifics at gmail.com. The maintenance of the immune system can be costly, and a lack of dietary protein can increase the susceptibility of organisms to disease. And see, like this doesn't say anything about honeybees, because I'm not talking specifically about honeybees. I'm talking about all organisms at this point. Like if you guys just stopped eating protein, you probably wouldn't be very healthy for very long. Because protein has all these wonderful things in it, mainly like amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of life, so they help all your cells to develop and all your cells to function. Honeybees are the same thing. They need protein. In protein, they eat this stuff, but they eat other things too. So what is it that bees eat? Well, they eat carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are it's in the nectar of flowers. They eat protein, and this is the pollen of the flowers. That's where the protein comes in. And they need water. Can you guys tell what this is? Yeah, so it's a bird feeder, but it kind of brings a different, um, you know, perspective on the birds and the bees. It's a bird feeder, and there's, uh, I think, is this a, yeah, look at, there's little bees in here, okay? And they are eating stuff in the bird feeder. And this picture was taken in the spring in the Pacific Northwest in coastal Washington State. And there's no flowers around, there's nothing out there around for the bees to eat. But in the spring, they're brooding up. They need a lot of protein, so they're going to find it from other sources. And in this case, they're getting protein out of the seeds and the nuts and stuff in this bird feeder. Okay? So what I'm saying is that bees really rely on flowers, but if they can't find the protein that they need in flowers, they might go searching somewhere else. Okay, this whole idea of protein and bees building relationships with flowers is, is really around the pollen. Bees need the protein, but flowers need pollination. And pollination is the process where this, um, oh, I forgot, that's pretty fun. <laughs> Should try that? <laughs> there you go. Um, so there's a male part of the flower and it needs to get the male part, the pollen, needs to get to the female part somehow. Okay, so this is sexual reproduction. And plants can't really go out and like hug each other and do things that, you know, enable the boy part to get to the girl part very easy. So they need what we call a pollen vector, something to move the pollen from the boy part to the girl part. And this is where bees are really, really, really good. Did you guys all look at the, the little microscope out there? It says, are bees hairy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what was your answer? Yes. Yeah, bees are extremely hairy. And it's because they, have, they need to collect pollen, and pollen is uh, negatively charged. Bees are positively charged, and it sticks together, okay? And... The, the nectar that bees make honey out of, that carbohydrates, 
Flowers produce that, but flowers don't need that stuff. That's just a lure to get the pollinators to come in so that they can brush the pollen off. And then when the pollinator goes to the next flower and so tries to get the nectar, then they move the pollen from flower to flower. So that's plant sex happening right there. And the reason why plants need to have sex, well, it's like survival of the fittest sort of thing, right? So hopefully that this plant over here has certain genetic characteristics, and this plant over here has other certain genetic characteristics. And when they come together, hopefully those seeds, or that ideally the, it's the seeds that are encased in the fruit, that's a whole different story, but the seeds can create a new generation of plants that are hopefully better adapted to a changing environment than either of the parents before. That's why sex, cross-pollination, is so important. And pollen can come in all sorts of different colors. And if you look at this, this is collected from a pollen trap. And each of these, is, each pollen represents like one load on one bee's leg. So each pollen forager coming back would have two of these. Okay. And you can kind of see that there's different colors. There's some like beige and white and orange. And then, of course, all this yellow stuff. And the different colors are from different flowers, from different plants. But what's really interesting is even though all of this stuff looks yellow, you'd say, oh, it's all from dandelion or it's all from the same source. But not true because a lot of different flowers can have pollen that's the same color. So that's really, really hard <laughs> if you're just looking at a pollen trap or you're looking at bees coming in to say exactly what they're foraging on without really looking closer at what the pollen looks like. And when you look up close at what the pollen looks like, so this is all army green colored pollen. I didn't know what else to color it, call it as army green. But if you look here, there's at least one, two, three, uh, that's about three different plants represented, okay? Different pollen types represented. So these, are, these have been stained, um, and this pollen is from a different plant than that pollen, from a different plant than that. And what's really cool here is that you see that the pollens have the pollen, the individual pollen grains have all sorts of different shapes and textures and sizes. And the, the relationship between the pollinator and the, the plant and producing the pollen is so complex and so highly evolved that small details down to the texture of the pollen grain and the ability of that pollen grain to attach itself to that pollen vector, or a B in this case, is just so fine-tuned. And it's really, really, I think it's really awesome. So you, guys, you see these slits, and those slits are the same slits here. So what is what is pollination? How does it actually happen? Well, a pollen grain, what you just saw, needs to land on the receptive part of the, the plant, of the, the female receptive part of the plant. The ovaries are down here. And this stigma up there has, has a substance on it that will only germinate the pollen grains of the same species. So the only way that that plant can be pollinated is by pollen of that same species. I'm going on and on and on about this because pollen is fundamental to the nutrition of bees, but it's important for you as beekeepers to be well informed of what that relationship between flowers, pollination, and nutrition is. Okay? So when this pollen grain lands on here, this tube, a germination tube, a pollen tube, um, well, germinates and drops some sperm cells down there. There's your plant sex. It pollinates or fertilizes 
the ovule in here. Then you get seed development around that. You get fruit development. And then you get someone saying, oh, I really like apples. And you eat the fruit. And then you transport the seeds, hopefully, somewhere in fertile soil. And there you go. And then it turns out that these bees, they're super fuzzy. And they're really good at transporting the pollen. Because not only are they out there foraging for nectar and for carbohydrates. There's also bees that are out there actually foraging for pollen. And you can see it doesn't take much for that, um, for pollination to happen, but relatively to how, relative to how much the bees need of the pollen, like the plants get the pollination they need, but the, there's so much more pollen produced that the bees have some to take home and feed themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. So bees' hair, bees' legs are very hairy. Their bodies are hairy. Everything's really hairy. They've got these hairs, right, that <coughs> kind of collect the pollen. But then they also, has anyone watched a bee, like, groom themselves and then pack the pollen onto the legs? And they, they, they're really methodical, like, almost like cats grooming themselves. And they get this huge pollen load, and they'll bring it back home. So the thing that's interesting is the different, different pollens have all sorts of different types of amino acids, different types of vitamins, different types of minerals. Um, and it varies. Yeah, all these things that the bees need vary from plant to plant. And it's not only plant-specific. You can't say, like, rosemary plants are really high in X mineral and um, red gum are really high in this vitamin. Because it, it doesn't always, it's not always across the board. Because when you think about how plants, bless you, when you think about how plants grow and where they get their nutrients, well, they get their nutrients from the soil. Okay, so when you think about honeybee health, like, oh, great, now we have to think about soil health. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so, so <laughs> by being beekeepers, you're actually being, like, whole system thinkers. And you're actually thinking about what, what you see in the colony, what you see when you open up the box, how that relates to the world around you. And for me, that's kind of what... That's what keeps me engaged with bees. Besides, I really like honey. And I probably couldn't afford eating my honey if I didn't keep bees. So there's, there's bees in a colony. They have different, like, affinities. Different bees kind of are good at different things. Um, things being activities within the colony. Some bees are really good slash like, if, if insects can like stuff. Um, like to collect pollen, some like to collect uh, nectar, some are really good at collecting propolis, some are really good at collecting water. And, and they have kind of these affinities for doing these different jobs. Yet when there's a need, when there's a demand in the colony saying, hey, we need more of this stuff, you know, the the nectar forager that's like, I really like collecting nectar, said, so, okay, I guess I'll collect some pollen on this trip, right? <laughs> so they, they can, bees that would ordinarily not be collecting pollen can be motivated to collect pollen based on the pheromone triggers that are going on in the colony. Um, the pheromone triggers tell, tell, the foragers kind of, hey, this is the condition of the hive. These are, these are the things we need. It's kind of like a report back <laughs> mechanism. It's like reading the daily news. Um, so they, they also, if the pollen in the colony is getting low, the amount of pollen in the colony is getting low, then that sends a pheromone trigger and they say, okay, girls, today we're going to go collect these things. So, so moving here, I thought, oh gosh, beekeeping, I kind of understand it. There's... Um, you know, bees get pollen from, and nectar from plants. This is really good. And then I get here, and I'm like, oh, my God, 
these rely mostly on eucalyptus, and there's some eucalypts that are like pollen producing, some are nectar producing, some have really poor pollen. Beekeepers take their bees to nectar flows and to brooding flows, and this just blew me away. Okay, but you guys don't really need to be so keened in to what, um, what your environment is doing with respect to what the plants are providing for your bees because you live in this beautiful suburbia and you have gardens and there's a lot of focus that's been put on having plants that flower in your gardens and in your public lands. So the bees really have a lot of access to pollen and nectar and pollen. So that's really, really good. Um, the p weather, the different weather uh, conditions can trigger bees to collect pollen or not. And can you believe it? Like a bee coming back with, a, with pollen loads, it can be a sixteenth to a quarter of their total weight. So those bees are pretty strong to be able to fly, you know, up to 5K round trip with those huge pollen loads. And think of it this way, 17 to 34 kilos of pollen. Each colony needs that much pollen every year to survive. <coughs> but what do they do? How do they use it? Here's just different examples of pollen. And believe it or not, these colonies were like, this colony was here, another colony was right here, and another colony was right here. Okay, what do you guys notice that's different in these three pollen traps? Yeah, different, different colors, different amounts of different colors, and this is all based on recruitment. Right? A bee co comes home and says, hey, I found this stuff that's like this. It's really awesome. It's over here. And they're really excited about it. And they'll go out and tell their friends to go out and bring this stuff home. Whereas up in this colony, someone was really keen on this orange stuff. And someone was really keen on this purple stuff. And so they kind of had this, hey, everyone, let's go here for dinner sort of thing. And those flowers became really popular, where they had a whole different, um, maybe, palette in these colonies. But think of it a different way, okay? If every single one of these, you know, different plants represented here have a different amount of amino acids, have a different amount of proteins, have a different um, nutritional profile, perhaps that this colony's nutritional needs were different than this colony's nutritional needs based on whatever they're having to deal with within the colony. And whatever they're having to deal with within the colony is directly related to management, equipment, genetic propensity or genetic um, capacity to deal with different pests and diseases. So when, we st when you're excited about getting into beekeeping, and when I was really excited about just getting into beekeeping, the best advice that I got was get your head in as many colonies as you possibly can. If you have one or two colonies in your backyard, that's really, really great, but you're only seeing a small portion of all the things that you could possibly see in beehives. So each of these colonies are different, even though they're in the same small little apiary. Just bring in some pollen home. Okay, so they go out, foragers go out, and they collect it, and they bring this stuff home. And look at this is green. That's pretty awesome. And then they drop it off into the cells. Okay, you guys can, can you see that? Just freshly dropped off. See, pollen foragers have kind of a different, a little tougher job than nectar foragers because nectar foragers will come back and they'll stop at the door and then they'll, through trophallaxis, unload their load to a house bee and then the house bee will go put that nectar in a cell and start ripening it. But pollen foragers, they have to go all the way in, <laughs> find a cell, drop it off. Has anyone ever seen pollen forager drop off their pollen load? It's really cool. It's like, kind of like crickets where they rub their back legs together and they just <laughs> drop it off. Um, but what do you notice that's different between that 
in this. One is digested almost, and the other one is not. It, it, it's, yeah, you're, you're on exactly the right track, exactly the right track. So here, this is newly dropped off, and here, these have all been padded down. And the way it gets like from a B pollen load to in the cell, <coughs> drop it off, and then some one of these house bees has come along and actually like pounded it <laughs> down <laughs> with, their, with their head. And in that process of flattening it out, you get oh, these beneficial bacteria that are injected into the pollen. You guys remember that those pictures of the pollen? Well, they have this really, really, really tough, like really, um, I'm just going to say tough because I can't think of the, the right word for it, um, cell coating or a pollen coating, okay? And that's really hard to get through. It's really indigestible for the bees. But they don't want that stuff. They want the good stuff on the inside, right? Um, like the good stuff is the, the germplasm, all the stuff inside. That's where the nutrients are. So by bringing the raw pollen home, just here, and then pounding it down, inserting beneficial bacteria, <coughs> inserting beneficial fungi into it, those things start breaking down the, the cell walls of the pollen and make it digestible for the bees. So they're making like yogurt, bee yogurt. It's turning into, they kind of bake, it's turning into bee bread. So you're absolutely right, they're working on digesting it. What, what, what is this? What are we looking at here? Brood, yep. Here's our pollen band. Here's honey on the outside. Is this a new comb or an old comb? New. Brand new. They're just drawing this foundation out. Okay. And if you guys look back here, can you see those? Eggs. Eggs. Tiny little eggs. So you guys have all seen eggs now. Okay, so here's the pollen load that they just dropped off right there. And here's a pollen band. All right? And even though it looks like, hey, it's probably from one plant, um, it could be from a couple different plants just based on what's blooming at that time. S still the same color of pollen. Where is it? Like in the relationship to the whole big colony, where is this stuff? Right next to the brood. Right next to the brood. So you would think, like the first thing that I thought of anyway was, oh, they must feed pollen to the brood. No, that's not what happens. I'll tell you what happens in just a second. So look at these two different colors of pollen. These are all pollen, but what's different between these two? Yeah, one's shiny and one's not. Who, who's her, who knows? Who knows why one's shiny and one's not? <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, one's wet and one's shiny. One, ha one has honey on it and one doesn't. See, when they're making bee bread and they're, can you guys see like this is half yellow and this is kind of half purplish? So if you broke the, if you broke that cell up, if you sliced it, you'll see different layers of different colors because they don't, they don't put only one type of pollen in the cell. They'll just layer and layer and layer and layer, okay? So then you're getting like a nice mixture of different um, proteins and uh, different nutrient profiles. And then there's that fermentation process that happens, beneficial bacteria, fungi, and when this stuff is fermented appropriately, the bees will seal it over with a little bit of honey. And this stuff is called bee bread. So this is finished, this is food for the nurse bees. Let's see if there's anything else I want to say in here. Okay, so yeah, right up here, most of this pollen, like I said before, ain't, it's not fed to the brood. Most of the pollen is eaten by the nurse bees. 
And this is, the, this is the part that I really need you guys to key into. The pollen's eaten by the nurse bees, so their hyperpharyngeal glands, their brood food glands, can develop so that they can feed the brood. Pollen means royal jelly and worker jelly, so you have healthy brood, have a healthy next round of bees coming on. Again, the difference here. This is really good. You'd be really happy if you saw this in your colony. And look at the difference in the hyperpharyngeal glands. The hyperpharyngeal glands are just up here in the heads of the nurse bees. And these are hyperpharyngeal glands of bees, nurse bees, that have had a really high protein, high pollen diet. Look how beautiful and big they are. Well, look at the hyperpharyngeal glands of bees that haven't been fed a high protein diet. They're just totally shrunk, okay? So it's that royal jelly and the worker jelly that's used to feed all of the baby developing bees. So it's like breast milk or it's just like any sort of milk from any sort of mammal that you have to feed your young really high quality stuff so that they can develop properly. And this is a larvae floating on a, just a gorgeous pool of royal jelly. And look at the difference. I'm sorry that up, up here is out of focus, but you can see how they're really dry and kind of contorted. And you might think, oh, um, I've got a brood disease, which you don't have a brood disease, you just have a malnourished colony. Whereas here, really nourished, highly nourished. These, these bees have every opportunity to be the best bees, fat, happy bees possible. So the glands and the bees, um, they change over time and the jobs within the colony. I don't expect you guys to, to really like read this, but what I want you to get out of it is that the job in the colony for the bees changes over time and it's directly related to the glands that are developed. So let's see, where are we from rearing young brood right here. Rearing young brood, six days old. Okay, this is when most of the bees are rearing young brood. So this is when their hyperpharyngeal glands are going to be the most full and fat. That's when they're going to need, those nurse bees are going to need as much pollen as they can eat so that they can feed the babies. Okay, if colonies are protein deficient, if they don't have the right amount of pollen, um, the developing bees can be underweight or malformed. You might see bees come out with deformed wings, or they could be really tiny. Um, we don't, as far as I know, we don't have deformed wing virus here in Australia. Maybe, no, okay. Um, but you still can get disformities because they're malnourished. Um, they could cannibalize the young, so the queen could be doing a really, really awesome job, but then they don't have enough resources to feed all the babies, so they start cannibalizing the young. So then, what do you see? Shotgun brood pattern. Then you freak out, and then you think maybe you have AFB, or you have some other issue, when in reality you don't, you just have hungry bees. So every time you go into the brood nest, like Daniel was saying, you're reading the frame. You're not only looking at like, the quality of the brood pattern, you're looking at where are the resources in that nest? Is there pollen? Is there a nice harbor bridge pollen band around your brood nest? The answer should be yes. And if there's not, well, there's lots of pollen supplements, like on-the-market pollen supplements, that you can get and you can just feed it to your bees and it's a really easy fix. By having low protein in your colony, it leaves them susceptible to diseases. So if you guys are underfed, malnourished, you can get sick a lot easier because you don't have the immune system to be able to handle just common <coughs> issues. Same thing with bees. Look at these fat bodies. Yeah, bees have fat bodies, okay? And it's within these fat bodies where a lot of the 
the um, individual immunological defenses occur. Okay, so if the bees don't have these fat bodies by eating enough protein, uh, <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have the individual immune response that they could to be able to fend off uh, European fowl brood infection, chalk brood infection, Nasema, whatever. Maybe they don't have enough energy to chase that small hive beetle and corner it in the bottom of the colony. And the thing that's really interesting about pollen, not only um, is like having enough of it important, but having a diversity of pollen is really, really important. And studies have shown that it's not necessarily the, um, the nutritional profiles of a specific pollens, but when you get all different diversity of pollens together, the, <laughs> this is so cool, the bees can produce more of this enzyme called glucose oxidase. Okay, glucose oxidase is basically hydrogen peroxide. So they can keep, they keep the colony clean, they keep their nest clean with this enzyme that can fight bacterial infections. I think it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> the other thing here that I want to kind of go over with you guys is this fat body content, the fat bees. So that's where, that's where these antimicrobial peptides are created. The antimicrobial peptides are the things that can go and like encapsulate a pathogen, like encapsulate a chalk brood spore in the gut of the larvae if they act, happen to get fed a chalk brood store, uh, spore, they can fight it off. The other thing that pollen that turns into bee bread is really important for is increasing this, the gut micro, microflora and the, just the beneficial microbiotic community within the colony. So there's, <laughs> it's just phenomenal, you guys, but there's actually, there's actually bacteria in the guts of the bees and within the like microbiotic community of the colonies that can fight, that's active against P. larvae, which is Penibacillus larvae, which is the causative agent of AFB. Okay, so there's, there's all this stuff that goes on and has been going on for millions and millions and millions of years um, in healthy beehives that are properly fed, that have the right amount of nutrition, and there, there's all these symbiotic relationships. Like, and what Daniel is saying is that a lot of times, these diseases, they're beekeeper diseases. They're beekeeper perpetuated diseases because we get in the way of this stuff. So like, just for, an, for example, okay, if we've got this positive, beneficial, microbiotic community going on within the colony, and you see some e bees starting to break down in your colony, and then you put some um, antibiotic in your colony, what's going to happen? Yeah, you destroy all that, all the living stuff that's helping in different levels within that colony. So I'm not saying like, hey, never use antibiotics. What I'm saying is you're dealing with a very, very complex system that's more than just the complexity of the bees interacting amongst themselves. You're dealing with layers and layers of life within this colony. And just be very thoughtful about any action that you do, especially when it comes to antibiotics and uses of pesticides and medications within the colony. You're going in pollen. Yep. Can I, um, you have a use of pollen that's actually going to be radiation. Yeah, irradiated pollen. So you irradiate the pollen, all pollen. Yep, so you're reducing the risk of getting any more infection. And that doesn't damage the pollen? Um, look, I'm not exactly sure how irradiation impacts the pollen. Do you guys know? You two? Okay, yep. So, that being said, if, if irradiation is killing every single living thing within the pollen, the pollen itself, one of the
benefits of having pollen come in is because it has its own like world of life within it. So it's not just the proteins and the amino acids and all that stuff that are coming in. It's the whole complex thing. So if, you're, if your goal is just to boost the protein in the colony, there's like really great supplemental products like Bee Build, um, things, things that are, you know, maybe have soy flour, or brewer's yeast, or things like that, that'll get your bees off to a, just enough of a help that they can rebuild their lives. Um, if you're going to trap your own pollen in times of, like, lots and lots of pollen coming in, and then feed that, your own pollen back to your own bees, that's an option. But other than that, I wouldn't trust any somebody else's pollen to feed to your bees. Um, how long does the, uh, the pollen that's stored last? I mean, the reason I ask is that I've observed on a number of occasions that there, there's lots of bees coming in, bringing in good pollen loads. And yeah. When you open up the hive, there's not that much oh, stored pollen. Well, that's the thing, because they're eating it and they're using it. You probably have a nice amount of brood in there. Right, and you're eating it and using it as fast as they can bring it in. Yeah, yeah. But you're gonna see, like, as it's kind of as the brood rearing decreases, the pollen might, the pollen foraging might stay the same. So the needs of the colony, for, with respect to pollen, are less. So that's when that stored bee bread comes is really really important because they'll have that in the colony. Maybe then we go into winter, the brood rearing really closes down, and they've got all that stored bee bread. And then once spring comes around, when, well the temperatures get warm, but maybe the world doesn't know, the flowers don't know in spring yet. There's no pollen available in the environment. The bees have that stored pollen so they can start brood rearing early early. Oh, yeah. Yep. And, that, and that's the idea of fermenting it and then putting that layer of honey on it. It's just <coughs> stable. And this thing about glucose oxidase and the diversity is really important. The fact that bees need flowers and flowers need bees, I think you got that. Um, have a think about bees cannibalizing the larvae. If you look you open a frame, or you open your colon, you pull out a frame, you see a shotgun pattern, okay, look closer. That's all it is, is saying, hey, look closer. First thing, look at, well, are there any perforated cells? That's a good place to start. Also, look at what do the larvae look like? Do they look pretty good? Or do they look kind of dry? Do they look kind of like they're not floating on this beautiful pool of royal jelly? You know, if, if they don't have enough to eat, then, again, they can cannibalize the larvae and it could um, lead to other thoughts in your brain. So this is, this is kind of stopping here. I have one more slide that I want to bring you guys into for the little discussion this afternoon. <laughs> I'm just going to go through these. There's three pictures, and you guys kind of just hold them in your minds. Okay? Something kind of in the middle. When I started thinking about stock selection and why it's important for you guys to understand how to requeen and how to put the desired stock in your colonies instead of just let them requeen themselves. And this is what I came up with. They could be really, really managed. They could be totally wild. Or they could have a combination of traits. Would this one make it a night on the streets? How about this one? Yeah, what about that one? Okay, so how much work, how much beekeeper involvement do, do they take? And those are the things for you guys to just kind of consider and think about as we get into this afternoon and I'll just share with you guys my thoughts on stock selection and why it's important. That's it.